This is the Cockroach Bay Nature Preserve on the edge of Tampa Bay in southwest Florida. That's St. Petersburg in the background. Some 20 years ago, what is now a nature preserve was mostly degraded farmland and shell quarries. But today, after a major ecological restoration project, it's becoming a natural landscape again. The great horned owls begin their breeding season in winter, much earlier than most other birds. This year, in December, down on the edge of a mangrove channel, a pair begins to wake up in the late afternoons. I think they spend the day hidden behind the Spanish moss that covers the big oaks. Great horned owls usually mate for life. The frequent hooting at the beginning of the nesting season re-establishes the bond, and it keeps other owls away. They are territorial. The sexes look alike, but the male is usually a little smaller than the female. His voice, however, is deeper in pitch than hers. So that's the female up on the dead tree, being answered by the male in the oak tree down below. The owls are not nest builders. They like to move into the empty nest made by another big bird, like this osprey nest on the snag. Should the later breeding ospreys want it again, they'll find it already occupied. <laughs> I guess the female thought about using this empty osprey nest, but apparently it didn't suit her. The owls nested somewhere else that year. The nest remained vacant until near the end of March, when a pair of late breeding ospreys moved in. A year has come and gone. It's winter again, a better time for humans in the preserve. For a few months the weather is mostly cool and dry, and unless it's a wet winter, the mosquitoes are usually not so numerous. Winter brings in the birds from the north. The wetlands that seem nearly birdless in the summer now often are crowded with winter migrants and with the still numerous young of Florida's past summer's breeding season. The alligators that almost never let you see them in the summer now feel the need to leave the cooler water and warm themselves in the midday sun. A large number of robins spend the winter here when the sable or cabbage palms produce a good crop of fruit. The fruit's an important part of their winter diet. And you see them foraging in the short grass of the winter trails just like they do in the summer lawns of their breeding grounds farther north. This year, the wax myrtle produces an abundant crop of fruit, 
and clouds of overwintering tree swallows swoop in to eat the little waxy berries. And in early January, here's one of the owls again, in the late afternoon, down by the mangrove channel where I saw the pair last year. On January 9th, I'm surprised to see one of them, it must be the female, apparently settled on eggs in the old osprey nest, the one she had rejected the previous winter. Incubation for the owl eggs lasts four to five weeks. She's got a long time to sit there, but the male will bring her food every night. In February, while the owl sits on her eggs, a pair of ospreys moves into a nest a mere wing beat or two away from the owl. I wonder if this is going to cause problems. Great horned owls have been seen to attack osprey nests after dark and carry away the chicks. So for these owls, the situation is about as convenient as they could wish for, should they get tired of the rabbits and rodents that make up most of their diet. The ospreys are large and powerful hawks, and they might raid an owl nest if they had to, but they've evolved to be experts at catching fish, and fish makes up most of their diet. In the breeding season, the male osprey courts the female with a sky dance, often with a fish in his talons. She can see that he's fit, that he knows how to find food, and that he ought to be able to help raise a family. Once that's settled, he goes to work gathering material for the nest. And with this pair, it seems he has to do all the construction as well. It looks to me like his noisy mate does little besides encouraging him to work. On February 18th, the female is sitting high on the nest, as if something bigger than eggs were underneath. I don't see the owl chicks until March 9th. There are two, the most common number for great horned owls. One of the owlets is larger and more active than the other. The smaller would have been from an egg laid a few days after the first. With great horned owls, the older, larger chick rarely harms or kills the younger, smaller one. Unless food is scarce, both usually live to fledge and leave the nest. March 16th. Everything about the same in the owl nest. I think the female stays there most, if not all the time. I haven't seen it without her being there, but she sometimes may leave at night to hunt if the male is not bringing enough food. The female osprey may be sitting on eggs. She stays there now, while the male comes and goes. Nearby, a cottontail is out in the morning, helping to keep the trail cut. These rabbits are owl food, one of the common items on the owl menu. We'll see evidence of that a little later. Both chicks are looking fat and content. The rabbits and rodents must be plentiful, and the male must be a good hunter. On the 
morning of March 17, there is no mother in the nest. The first time I've seen this. But soon in she comes. She'd been keeping watch in a tree nearby, just across the narrow mangrove channel. The male calls from the oak woods below, and the female answers. Red-shouldered hawks are noisy and active in the oak woods, and it seems to be worrying the owls. But the hawks are always noisy at this time of year. They've got their minds on more important things than harassing the owls. On the night of March 20th and 21st, there's a hard rain and windstorm. In the morning, I'm relieved to see that the nest and the snag and the owlets are still there. Because of the nest, that snag catches a lot of wind. You can see it sway. Sooner or later, it will break or fall. And whenever the wind is high, I worry about it at least a little. In spite of the storm and wind, the adults had caught something for the chicks. The wind blows a lot in the winter, and I wonder how it affects the owls. Feather and down coats keep them warm, but wind would make it harder to hunt. Rabbits, for instance, can't hear so well when the wind blows, and they tend to stay in thick cover, and the owls often use sound as well as sight to locate their prey. Nevertheless, there always seem to be food for the chicks, and the high exposed nest keeps them safe from most nest robbing animals. Raccoons would like to be one of those nest robbers. They spend a lot of time in trees, but they need a rough surface to get their claws into. I don't think they could get up the owl's high, barkless snag, and it would take a stupid or reckless raccoon to brave those protective adults anyway. Here's the mother doing one of the most important things a bird has to do. In preening, the bird runs its bill over each individual feather. And that cleans the feather and gets rid of parasites and helps the feather barbs lock together. Birds have an oil gland at the base of the tail and preening spreads the oil through the feathers. Oiled feathers keeps them water repellent so that the bird doesn't get soggy and cold when it rains. I think maybe it feels good, too. March 24th is an uncommon spring morning without wind. The mullet are jumping for joy, but maybe not. No one knows why mullet jump, much less if they can be joyful. The ospreys keep busy and noisy. Maybe they're excited to see eggs in there. The owlets are growing. I think there's plenty of food for them, often more than they can eat at once. I often see them grabbing a bite from the bottom of the nest now and then throughout the day. They keep a watch on everything, down below and up above. It looks like they instinctively know that a soaring hawk can mean trouble. That bill snapping is a warning sound when they feel anxious or threatened.
Now the female watches her chicks from a tree on the other side of the mangrove channel. That puts us on the same side of the water, but although I am right below her, she does not seem to mind, at least not much. She never flies and mostly ignores me. Today, the female is on her usual perch, but now, in another tree close by, I see an owl that I assume is the male. Like his mate, he doesn't seem to mind being looked at. This is a behavior that gets many of them shot. Shooting is often the leading cause of mortality for great horned owls. They're also killed by cars, electrocution, and pesticides. The wind still blows strong nearly every day. Both owls still keep watch on the nest from the trees across the mangrove channel. I often see bald eagles soaring high above the preserve, but today they land in a pine close by and worry the owls and the ospreys. Bald eagles have been seen to swoop in and carry away full-grown ospreys from a nest. If they have to, great horned owls will eat almost any kind of mammal, bird, reptile, or fish. But it's probably easier to get the furry mammals like rabbits and rodents. Rabbit is what we see here at 6 p.m. It probably had been caught last night or early this morning. A great horned owl can fly away with a rabbit. The owls here weigh from two and a half to three and a half pounds, the Florida cottontail a little over two pounds, but the owls can carry that much and more. Cottontail rabbits do seem to be abundant in the preserve, I see them on or near the trails almost any time I'm there in the early morning or late afternoon. Owls and bobcats, coyotes and other predators like them a lot, and the rabbits easily keep up the supply. In Florida, a female rabbit can have as many as seven litters a year, averaging about five young per litter. That's more or less 35 young a year for the most prolific rabbits, and the females born early in the year can have their own young by the end of the year. There's no plague of rabbits here, so you know somebody's been eating them up. This evening I hear an owl croak in the oak tree above me. This gives it away. I wouldn't have noticed it otherwise. It must be the mother, and I guess she wants some of the food left over in the nest, because in a minute she flies there and begins to eat. Sometime earlier I had seen her in the nest feeding the chicks. After dinner, she stands for a long time above the nest, and she's still there when I have to leave. Almost the end of March, and those little owls are still in the nest. I think it's about time for them to be hopping out onto the branches of the snag. By now all the birds are breeding, or hoping to. The songbirds try to defend the territory with song, but if it doesn't work, they have to fight. Speaking of fighting, the cardinal by the parking lot is obsessed with driving away the rival it thinks appears with every car. It makes a mess of side view mirrors. It is kind of funny, but it does unduly stress the bird. I begin covering mine with bags.
The big female soft-shell turtles come out of the freshwater marshes to lay their eggs, the first of several nesting trips they'll make during spring and summer. It's a bit of a risky endeavor, but laying in the middle of the day, as they usually do, means that most of their predators are asleep. They tend to dig their nests in the bare earth along the trails, where the digging is easiest and where the sun will warm the eggs below. Every night, however, that's just where the raccoons can easily find them. I often see the results of their nest raiding. The raccoons are good at this, and most of the nests will not make it. This morning, an osprey flies unusually close to the owl nest. I don't know if it's aggression or accident, but the owls immediately go into defensive mode. The mother flies to the nest and calls to the male, who answers. The owlets begin to rasp, and all three are turned toward my side of the water, not toward the osprey nest. If the worry isn't the osprey, I don't know what causes it. I can't see anything threatening over here. They've seen me here almost every day for weeks and have never before carried on like this. Young owls are out of the nest. Not far, but it shouldn't be long before they take their first real flight away from the nest tree. Right now, they still huddle together for comfort. At this stage, they're about six or seven weeks old. The faithful mother is still on watch nearby, a little bothered by a feather on her beak that she can't get rid of. Big news this morning! There's only one chick in the nest tree. Where's the other one? Is that it on a nearby snag? Looks content. Can a bird be proud of itself? I can imagine it thinking. So, now what? A few wing beats would have taken it there from the nest. The trajectory was downward. I wonder if it can get back up to the nest. It was only a day or two later when the other owlet must have taken its maiden flight, but I did not see it, nor did I see where it went. This evening, one owlet has made it across the mangrove channel to the oak trees above me. I can hear the mother up there too. I imagine they're talking about dinner because a few minutes later, all three are back in the nest eating. While the three are at dinner, I see the male watching from an adjacent snag. I've never seen the four of them in the nest together. I think that only happens at night when the male brings food. When they 
can manage it, they swallow their prey whole. The owl's stomach dissolves the usable parts, and the fur and larger bones are put into a lump and later regurgitated. These are the so-called owl pellets that you might find under a nest or owl roosting site. By now, both owlets are freely flying and usually spending the day in a tree nearby, but apparently not so smart about getting out of the hot sun. You can see the guller fluttering, the pulsing of air through the throat that causes evaporative cooling. The owlet has gone to the tall, thin posture that the owls often use as they sit out the daylight hours. It's usually done in more hidden spots, it probably adds to their camouflage by changing their more recognizable owl outline. A strong wind this morning. It would seem to be a good day to shelter in one of the big oaks below. But both owlets are in the nest. Wind is what they've grown up with. This is the last day I will see them in the nest tree. On the morning of the 18th, I can't find the young owls. But here's one of the parents, still on guard in the usual place. There is still no sign of young in the osprey nest. The ospreys on the platform nests by the road are already feeding their chicks, but they began nesting much earlier. One outlet noticeable this morning, the other three somewhere out of sight, maybe even sleeping during the nesting season, with the mother and her chicks almost always awake, exposed, and active during the day, it's hard to remember that these owls are supposed to be mostly nighttime creatures, and that they are during the rest of the year. This morning, for the first time, not a single owl visible or audible in their usual location near the nest. But as I walk away, I think I see a familiar silhouette against the sky, far across the mangrove channel. It's one of the young owls, acting like king of the mountain. The world is still young for them. They're figuring out what to do with themselves. So they're on the other side now, in the oak woods where the male had stayed for most of the nesting. It's a bit of a walk to skirt the mangroves and get to the owl woods. It'll take me a few minutes, but I'm pretty sure I'll find the owls there. In the oak woods, sure enough, here's one of the young ones in a tree just above me. I see one of the parents there too. I found them here for the next few days, but then I left town and I didn't see them again until June 29th. Not in the oak woods, but on the other side, not far from their nest tree. The parents, as a mated pair, own their territory and stay in it year-round. If food is abundant, the size of the owl's territory may be less than a square mile, or about two and a half square kilometers. In other places, it can be much larger. 
Their children will stay with them until autumn, eating food that the parents bring them. Then they'll have to leave the parents' territory and hunt for themselves. They'll become what's called floaters, silently living on the edges of a mated pair's territory. Eventually, they may get their own territory, find a mate, and raise a family. I'm puzzled by the ospreys. There seem to be no young in the nest, although there should be by now. The bird in the nest must be the male, because that's the female with a fish. I recognize her by her necklace or breastband. The male had none. She doesn't stay, and in a minute I see her eating on a nearby branch. This may have been an unsuccessful nesting. The ospreys seem to be a strange pair from the beginning. The nest is unoccupied when I return in June. I was gone for a month, and when I got back in early June, the trail to the oak woods had vanished under a jungle of guinea grass and other plants. I couldn't see the snakes that might be underfoot. And besides, the heat, humidity, and mosquitoes were a little too unpleasant. I left the woods alone for better times. Summer is not the best time for humans in the preserve, and I don't go there much. But on June 29, along a trail near the owl nest, here's an owl in the open at mid-morning. And here's another one close by. I bet they're the two owlets I had watched grow up, now looking quite like adults. They're still keeping each other company. The first one checks me out. I imagine it thinks, haven't I seen you before? Oh well, who cares? And that's the end of this owl story. After the nesting season, they finally get to sleep away the day. I don't see or hear them again for the rest of the summer.